All right, welcome back everybody. This is our last panel and I won't say we've saved the best for last because that would be a slight toward the other panels, but uh, this is certainly a critically important issue and we have a terrific panel to discuss it. It is climate change back to Paris, now what? And moderating this session is Mike Grumwald, who's a senior staff writer for Politico magazine. And before joining Politico, he also was a staff writer for my hometown newspaper, the Boston Globe, as well as the Washington Post, and perhaps very relevant to this discussion, the author of the great book, The Swamp, The Everglades, Florida, and the Politics of Paradise. Mike, the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much, David, and thanks for putting this all together. It's uh, really impressive, and FIU is such an awesome institution for those of us down here in Miami. Um, let me, uh, we've got a great panel that uh, I'm going to introduce very sh quickly, and then hopefully uh, we'll, we'll just get into it. Um, we've got uh, Simone Ataide, uh, who's an associate professor at FIU. She's an environmental anthropologist and interdisciplinary ecologist. Uh, she studies the impact of large infrastructure and climate change on indigenous peoples and local communities, particularly focused on the Amazon. Um, we've also got Alex Dagon, uh, professor of sustainability at Arizona State. He's the CEO and co-founder of Conservation X Labs, which is an innovation and technology startup focusing on conservation. Uh, he was once the chief scientist at the, at the US Agency for International Development, and he helped create Afghanistan's first national park. Um, Kevin Grove, uh, another associate professor at FIU and editor-in-chief of Political Geography. He researches the history, politics, and geography of resilience, uh, especially in Miami and the Caribbean. And finally, Michael Heithouse, who's the Dean of the Car College of Arts, Science, and Education at FIU. Uh, he's also a marine ecologist who specializes in sharks, so uh, hopefully he'll Tell us a little bit about the shark connect, shark week connection to uh, to climate change. Um, but so let's uh, let's jump right in. We're at a crazy moment for climate change. Um, after spending the last four years kind of looking at our phones in constant terror of you know what's going to be the next immediate crisis that we're all going to be talking about, uh, we can now focus again on the larger existential crises you know that. Uh, that affect humanity. Um, uh, we've already got a new president who's brought the United States back into the Paris Agreement. Um, there's really kind of broad consensus around the world, uh, just about everywhere, that this is at least an issue that's got to be dealt with, um, that this is a moment to deal with it. Um, and so uh, I think, why don't we start by just with the question, the title of the panel, now what? Um, and let's uh, just kind of do a quick go around the panel and start starting with Simone. Now what? What's going to happen? Thank you, Michael. Can you hear me? Hear you great. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so now what? Um, I think we have several points and uh, homework to do here in, in the U.S. and abroad. And the first point that, that I wanted to comment on is from actually from the previous uh, panel, Dr. Rafael Fernandez de Castro's uh, quote that he said, we have the single most important window of opportunity to tackle climate change and the pandemic together, now with the Biden, Biden administration. But only addressing these things um, nationally is not enough. We know we are super interconnected. So I think that the global coalitions are very uh, critical in this moment. And uh, we need to strengthen the global coalitions. And in a time of uh, an era of digital information, we really need to fight disinformation. And uh, it's a challenge, I think. It's a real challenge to fight disinformation and to fight climate change denial. Later on on my comment, I'm gonna uh, address that as well. Um, and. The third point that I think is important is also to show that there is a viable path. It is possible actually to reconcile and to have a strong economy and fight climate change at the same time. So that would be a challenge to show to the population, to show to uh, 
you know, to our citizens that it is possible and to actually um, compile a couple of cases and examples on how this is happening all over the world and, and be inspired by that. I think these are my three main points for this question. I pass to the other things. Alex, you wanna take a shot? Yeah, so I, you know, one of the, I think this is the first time that we are seriously considering climate security as national security. We have John Kerry, you know, former US Senator, former Secretary of State, now with cabinet rank. We have incredible individuals, part of the team as well, like Gina McCarthy. Uh, we have Biden's speech uh, that he just gave at the State Department, highlighting that we're integrating climate objectives across all diplomacy uh, and raising the ambition of their targets. You know, we have an executive order that has really pushed the national intelligence, uh, the director of national intelligence, the DNI, to to do an assessment. And the heads of most of the major uh, cabinet level agencies and departments to integrate climate change into the war gaming, into their plans, and thinking about what it means. Um, and and you know, I wrote I wrote my senior honors thesis as an undergrad. Uh, at Duke on redefining environmental national security in terms of environmental change. And it, it is a, you know, we are now 30 years on <laughs> from that moment. So it is a, it is a great sign, but I think for us to actually be successful, we need to fundamentally rethink the, 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 the majority of our solutions and, and, you know, climate change, um, at much like conservation and the two are interlinked. And in fact, we so focused on climate change that we forget about conservation as actually being part and parcel of how we address it. But it, it you know, for a long time, it, it is sort of conservation and climate change have been this small, you know, stream on the side of the Mississippi and the Mississippi itself is our fundamental economy. And we need to think about how we are replacing and transforming technologies, products, supply chains, and sectors. And that means, you know, as we have a world that's growing warmer, we also have more people moving in middle class who want cooling technology, who want f protein and food, feed and fiber and materials that all, and the electronics that we are literally watching this on are driving the destruction of places like the Amazon. Uh, through artisanal scale mining, the Congo Basin, 80 other countries around the world. We need to think about what it means to create new economies for the future uh, and how we address uh, these things. But those are opportunities. Those are opportunities for a Marshall Plan in the United States for the forgotten corners of America. They're uh, opportunities for us to actually examine how we're subsidizing destruction you know, we need to have USAID, for instance, that is climate neutral and extinction neutral across its, not its operations, but its portfolio of investments. And we need to actually integrate conservation development and economic growth looking forward. The one thing, uh, you know, the one sort of, and I think there's a lot of optimism, the one sort of pessimistic note is, I also work on One Health and emerging infectious diseases and links to conservation. And in 2009, I wrote a memo as part of the policy planning staff, the Secretary Rice, that said, we, we, um, it is not enough to respond to SARS or react to SARS as we were doing with billions of dollars. We need to think about the upstream factors that give rise to these pandemics. Uh, what are the links to environmental trade, wildlife trade, environmental degradation, and climate change? And the memo was just told that this isn't an important enough issue. And here we are later on. I feel that the pandemic has elevated climate change as something that we need to address as a society. But I'm also worried that we will forget once again and then only deal with it when we're in the middle of a crisis. Kevin? Yeah, thanks, Michael. And thanks, thanks everyone. I think, um, yeah, I think Alex raised a lot of uh, sort of good points there, as did Simone. I think, you know, what I'd add to that is that, you know, I think, you know, we're going to be seeing that, you know, as Alex mentioned, we're going to be getting a lot more federal uh, support now, uh, federal support that was simply sort of rolled back or not present in previous administrations. We're going to see this support that's going to come in and sort of, you know, dovetail with already existing actions that are already going on as folks, you know, sort of in the private sector, in the philanthropic sector, um, you know, sort of in, you know, community organizations in their everyday lives are already sort of coping with and trying to 
deal with and address, um, you know, sort of the various manifestations of climate change that we're seeing. You know, it's not only sort of future sea level rise or the kinds of spectacular catastrophes that Hollywood has trained us to recognize as, you know, this is what an emergency is. But, you know, sort of climate change is stuff like COVID. You know, one day, you know, sort of we just woke up in sort of early March and said, wow, we're actually been in the middle of this pandemic for a while now. And this is what, you know, sort of the experience of climate change, you know, sort of already is for a number of people. You know, people are already sort of dealing with, you know, sort of various impacts of um, sort of ongoing environmental changes in their everyday lives. And they've been designing and developing ways of trying to address and live and cope with those, uh, those new changes that they've been experiencing. And so, you know, as Alex said, it really does create an opportunity for us to go in and kind of redesign institutions that structure sort of public life. You know, we have opportunities to go in and to reconstruct economies that are not based around, you know, sort of solely the principle of individual profit maximization, but we can go in and we can begin thinking about, you know, what does it mean to have, you know, sort of economic policies that address environmental issues, that address social welfare issues, uh, that sort of reconceptualize how economy and society and environment all sort of interlink together. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of new opportunities here, uh, but I think, you know, as the COVID pandemic response is showing, there's a lot of possibilities that, uh, you know, sort of as we're confronted with these, you know, sort of ongoing and unfolding, you know, sort of slow emergencies, if we want to think of it in those terms, you know, that we're going to be seeing, you know, a lot of very sort of the kind of responses that we're going to get are the kinds of responses that are going to be reinforcing uh, various forms of social and economic and racial inequalities. Michael. Great. Well, I, I think wonderful points that everyone's made. And just maybe to try to extend on those, I think that what we really need to start seeing is that bigger systems approach. It's not just about Paris. And, you know, we almost get too focused on we're back in Paris. And we need to think about it, you know, environment and economy are not two separate issues. The economy is a subset of the broader environmental issue. Conservation fits into that. And I think if we don't put it all together, um, we're going to run into challenges. And I think the, the hopeful thing is we're seeing that happen at the federal government level, that they are taking that broader view of what's going on. I mean, at the end of the day, we can get to climate sustainability, but uh, if we don't have anything left worth sustaining with that biodiversity, with the intact food systems, you know, what's the point? So we do need to look at this more holistically. And I do, you know, picking up on some things that Simone said, I worry a little bit that we may start to get perfection getting in the way of progress, that we're going to fight amongst the group of how are we going to move forward so we don't take some of the, the steps that we really need to, to make. And getting those big systemic steps, is, first steps is really important at the government policy level, even while we're working on you know, individual responsibility issues. So I think we, we need to get it moving, recognize that Paris may not get us all the way to where we need to get to, but it is a dang good first step that we need to, to make while we try to fight through a lot of the, the disinformation and uh, you know really targeted campaigns to make us not take the steps we need to make. That's great. I mean, that's a, I think that's a really good intro. I think you guys, that obviously we were sort of starting out at 10,000 feet and uh, talking about some big structural changes that we're gonna need to see and, and sort of different systemic thinking. Um, let me to just do one more round of now what, let me ask you, and this could be a way for you guys to, to bring in some of your individual expertise. Um, you know, we're in this moment of incredible change, right? Solar got cheap, wind got cheap, um, electric vehicles are starting to happen. Um, we're even starting to see, uh, you know, alternative meat and alternative protein, um, you know, a lot of real change on the horizon. Um, and now we've got, you know, particularly in the US, but we've got a government that's sort of like, you know, hey, put me in coach, uh, what, what are we gonna do? What's something that you, what are some specific, if you could all kind of say a couple of specific things that you think can really kind of start moving the needle quickly, uh, not just on the kind of the big picture, but in really sort of reducing emissions by changing, uh, changing the way societies work. Um, maybe uh, Alex, you wanna take a shot? Yeah, I'll give I, I'll give one example, which is we're working on um, with the Rocky Mountain Institute and the Indian government on a global cooling prize. And if you're familiar with Project Drawdown, you know that the number one solution we could use for drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, for climate change is actually cooling technology. So refrigeration and air conditioning. 
And the challenge that we have with, with both of those in particular with air conditioning is 70% of the world's air conditioners are made by two companies. They're not the resellers, but they're the ones who actually make the core guts. They have zero incentive to actually advance the individual technology. Um, and in fact, there, I think some of the best air conditioners you can buy on the market are 10% as effective as the technology allows. Governments build their grid for their warmest day, the day that everyone flips on their air conditioners. Places like India, which are, is the world's biggest future market for air conditioning, right, will have to double its grid infrastructure just dealing with this. So we've run a competition for a 5x increase in efficiency of those air conditioners. We've had five of, and we've been running it in, in India, which actually been tested in a facility that we've been running with these, these units, the winning teams have been running it for, for 30 days. And we have five that not only beat 5X, but some that got to 10X. And scaling that technology up worldwide is the equivalent of taking Australia and Finland's emissions off the grid. And we can do that without Paris. So there's a lot of things we can do around innovation and technology. And part of what it takes is for the Indian government to serve as in a, you know, through a regulatory change as an advanced market commitment that then requires a change much like California emissions does with cars for the rest of the world that just helps us get there. And we can think about the same things with food, feed, you know, even the fibers in the, the fibers that are used in our clothing, even natural fibers are coated with plastic. And those account for a significant percent of greenhouse gases. So we got to think about creating new economies that help us actually get to where we need to be. And it's going to be insufficient with just the international agreements. if We don't have the private sector and innovation along with us. That's fascinating. The idea of setting up a competition. I guess you could probably go through that draw down list, do the same thing for food waste and plant rich diets. That's that's a that's huge. Idea. Um, maybe Michael, you want uh, you focus so much on the oceans. Is there uh, is there something in particular that that can happen that would uh, that to, that could help the oceans uh, store more carbon and uh, and die less? Did we lose Michael? All right, up oh, there we go. He's back. Sorry about that. I won't mention my internet carrier that I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is Did it my turn uh, now that I missed? Yeah, it? I was asking. I was asking if you could take a right. shot about the ocean, since uh, since that's such a area of expertise. And is there is there like what needs to happen there um, that can yeah, really? Well, Great. It's, it's a great question. Obviously, the oceans are, are really important to the climate system because that's where a lot of the heat's going in. But we also have the issues with ocean acidification as uh, carbon emissions go up. So uh, we can also use the oceans as a solution. And we talk about blue carbon. So seagrass beds, mangrove forests, uh, coastal marshes that can get a lot of carbon out of the air or store it. And so, you know, and part of it's just stopping the decline. And some estimates are that you know, we might be able to offset about 10% of the carbon losses from deforestation and land transformation on land if we just stop taking out as much seagrass as we are every year. Um, but we're also finding, and this is on land and in the oceans as well, that we need to protect top predator populations. So, you, you know, you joke about how do sharks relate to climate? Well, what we're finding is that, you know, having intact shark populations is really important for, uh, for keeping the big herbivores, the turtles and the sea cows from overeating that seagrass and then getting that carbon moved back into the atmosphere. So predators play an important role. And what we're finding is that they are especially important in the, in the face of extreme events. So as we have climate events like heat waves and even in oceans come in and, and destabilize systems, having those predators there is really important for the system rebounding. And if you think about ocean systems, it's not just the climate effects or the climate buffering you get, but they support fisheries, huge amounts of protein, protect uh, the shores from uh, from hurricane damage. So, you know, that's why you know, I really think that, you know, Alex hit, hit the nail on the head that conservation and climate have to go hand in hand because they feed back on one another. And that's just getting fisheries policy right. You know, it's getting pollution and uh, and runoff cleaned up and, and around the world. I think this is something that keeps getting repeated. A lot of the solutions we need are there. There is no silver bullet. We need kind of all of the above, but, but we know what we need to do. We just need to realize that we have the ability to do these things and just make it happen. 
Uh, Simona, I, I know I remember during one of the presidential debates this year, sort of out of the blue, Biden kind of said, oh, we're going to, you know, give give Brazil 20 billion dollars to protect the Amazon. And I was like, wait, a, is that new? I, I hadn't heard that one before. Like that's, you know, that's in, even in Washington, that's almost real money. Um, talk to me about how can we, uh, you know, deforestation is what it's like 15 percent of our emissions. And of course, like having these forests you know, if we didn't, you know, emissions would be so much higher than they are. Um, in addition to, obviously, we like our rainforests and, uh, you know, we like the stuff in them. Um, talk to me about, about what can be done to, uh, you know, to protect, protect places like the Amazon and how can new leaders actually make a, make a difference on that right now? Thanks, Michael. I have a couple of slides that I wanted to show at this point, uh, if we could have those on the screen, just one second. Okay, great. Yeah, so, so my comment on that is about the US foreign policy and the politicization of climate change, focusing on the Amazon. Next, please. Next slide. Yes, thanks. So we know that the Amazon biome is huge, that it spans eight countries in the French Guiana and holds the world's last large extinction of tropical forests. And it's also critically important for the global climate stabilization, the global economy, and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. But the region, as you said, is seriously threatened by increased deforestation, especially last year was, was horrible, land and water degradation and forest fires. So we, we should really consider the Amazon as a global emergency and should treat it as such. Um, scientists have predicted that we are getting close to a tipping point of no return. And I think that's not only regarding the Amazon, we are in all these like tipping points that are interconnected globally. And that we should really uh, think that these tipping points are imminent. We shouldn't wait, right? It's like Michael was saying, all of the above and we shouldn't wait anymore. Um, next one, please. Just wanna show a graph and, and is this possible? Is it possible to curb deforestation? Is it possible to reconcile the, uh, conservation with climate change um, mitigation and adaptation? So here is just to show the extent of deforestation and fire spots which occur in the, in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, in 2020, we had an area of around 21,000 square miles that was cut or burned down at the size of New Jersey or Israel and 61% was in Brazil. And on the right, you can see the importance of indigenous lands and protected areas as a buffer to contain deforestation and fires and protect biological and cultural diversity, like uh, what uh, Alex was saying. We're not just focusing on uh, emissions. We, we should really focus on uh, protecting biodiversity as well, which is all connected. Um, and we had a very good example uh, in the past of the, uh, during the action plan for the prevention and control of deforestation, the legal Amazon that was implemented was really, really effective. And that uh, included, you know, uh, concerted actions with subnational governments, with the state governments, multi-level governance, including civil society, including command and control. And that plan was suspended by the current uh, government of, of President Jair Bolsonaro. Next, please. So Brazil, before was a leader in conservation and curbing deforestation, an example to the world, and now is becoming, unfortunately, a leader in carbon dioxide emissions from deforestation, which is the third major source of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the world. Uh, next one, please. So that's what I wanted to get, that just last Friday, one week ago, a group of US climate leaders presented an ambitious plan for the protection of the Amazon to the Biden-Harris administration. And these include these four main policy levers that according to them, and I, I really appreciate that they mentioned that according to them, it should be implemented in partnership with indigenous and environmental advocates with the third sector, business leaders, national subnational governments, and so those levers, I'm not gonna, of course, explain, but just include public and private funding, forest-friendly trade, transparent and clean supply chains. We're talking about supply chains so important and robust diplomacy. However, it is expected there will be strong resistance from the Bolsonaro administration in Brazil, who publicly declared uh, uh, on your comment, Michael, uh, after uh, the Biden campaign offered $20 billion to protect the Amazon, and he declared that um, uh, 
Well, what some people still do not understand is that Brazil has changed. Today, its president, differently from the left, don't accept bribes or baseless threats. Our sovereignty is non-negotiable. So that was also in the, uh, on the top of the forestation, the spikes in the forestation, the fires on the top of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's just one more uh, slide here. Please the next. So we are going the wrong direction really uh, in Brazil in terms of like, uh, you know, what the compromise that we assumed for the Paris Agreement. There is a lot of uh, problems going on right now. Uh, we have strong policies, but there is a problem in the uh, policy reinforcement. Enforcement. Uh, we have paralyzation of the climate and Amazon funds, which is a real problem. Uh, and this was this, this problem was the focus of a last lawsuit filed by several political parties denouncing the current government's omission in regard to environmental protection, which, by the way, is a constitutional right of the Brazilian people. And just one more that I think is it's, it's a curious slide here, just to contrast what's going on in Brazil and what's going on here with like the, the society opinions and on climate change and how important is this issue for, for example, US citizens in contrast to Brazilian citizens. So actually this recent opinion research uh, results show that um, the majority of Brazilian citizens are concerned with climate change and recognize it as a threat. But in contrast in the US only around 37% of people are concerned. So this is a problem as well, is a discrepancy. And it has to do, in my opinion, with the, uh, with the strong climate change politicization and polarization that we see across parties, across Democrats and Republicans, and to the fake propaganda widespread by climate change deniers in the US. And just wanna close this, this comment highlighting the importance of doing sound scientific research and education of these issues, empowering civil society to mobilize against government's omissions and the importance of bridging differences across the parties and economic sectors uh, for the common good of protecting life on Earth. That was it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Simona. Uh, Kevin, let's uh, let's dig the you know that's incredibly uh, what's happening in the Amazon is very sad. Um, but then you see California is on fire, Siberia is on fire, Australia is on fire. Um, uh, you know, hurricanes, bad stuff happening, lots of places, um, and. Uh, and you know, not all in the U.S. Um, Kevin, you you think a lot about geography, about pl about place-based policy. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know what is it that the U.S. and also the you know the world can do to kind of deal with climate change, not just as a global as a global warming issue, but as a you know conservation issue that's you know causing real problems in real places. Yeah, you know, I think that's an important. Uh, consideration, an important point, because you know, a lot of the ways that we approach climate change through these sort of international treaties is we look at sort of national level metrics like, you know, sort of cutting carbon and stuff like that. But when you look at what, you know, sort of that is actually going on on the ground, you know, people are dealing with all these different kinds of issues. You know, the, you know, as you mentioned, Michael, you know, every, all these different places have been burning in the recent years. Um, you know, sort of in Miami, we're dealing with, you know, sort of sunny day flooding, you know, sort of is becoming a regular occurrence in more and more neighborhoods. Um, you know, if you're a homeowner in Miami, you know, your housing insurance rates just went up, you know, a somewhat sort of significant step, you know, in a lot of ways, that's kind of, you know, a little canary starting to, starting to uh, wobble on its perch in the coal mine there, uh, that insurers are getting a little bit of wet feet in Miami. Um, you know, and so, you know, and of course, you know, that news as well got sort of drowned out when the city of Miami mayor um, sort of went on social media and started uh, engaging in conversation with social media with Elon Musk about, you know, sort of, um, you know, building tunnels and, you know, developing Miami into this super, you know, chatting high, today. I heard yeah, that. yeah, exactly. The new, the new tech hub uh, of the world. And so, you know, sort of that, you know, sort of papered over, you know, sort of the more sober news uh, on, you know, sort of the, uh, the way that climate impacts are starting to reverberate through financial markets worldwide. Um, and then coming down, you know, to impact people's, uh, you know, sort of uh, insurance rates in Miami. But I think, you know, one of the ways, you know, that these kinds of, you know, sort of issues on the ground can, you know, be addressed. And, you know, I think, you know, the language of a window of opportunity is a good one here. Because, you know, when it comes to sort of, you know, sort of very local, sort of on the ground, you know, contextually specific manifestations of climate change, it often raises the question of, you know, how, you know, what kind of governance arrangements do we use to sort of make 
uh, sort of decisions within the public sphere. You know, how do we determine how to utilize, uh, you know, sort of local government, uh, state government, federal government resources to, you know, sort of monitor to address these various kinds of impacts. And so that's something that's been going on, you know, sort of in Miami. It's this you know, the turn in recent years to, you know, sort of interest in building resilience. And you know, the city of Miami and Miami Dade County and the city of Miami Beach participated in the. Uh, Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program uh, recently that uh, sort of wrapped up, you know, I think a year and a half ago with a big launch, and they've been following on, you know, sort of resilience plans and resilience strategies ever since. Uh, but one of the interesting things that came out through that was, uh, you know, sort of the way that these resilience uh, planning uh, procedures um, involved a lot of people from public groups and civil society groups who hadn't been involved in the conversation before. And so you saw sort of in a lot of ways, you know, the way that Simone talked about civil society groups increasingly getting shut out of policymaking decisions in Brazil. You know, in Miami, you're seeing, uh, you know, sort of community organizations, you know, at least at the level of resilience planning, you know, beginning to have a little bit more involvement in these kinds of decision-making procedures over, you know, sort of where and how to, you know, sort of build and locate, you know, seawall protections, uh, you know, what kind of uh, priorities and plans, you know, sort of make up, you know, sort of a, a resilient strategy. Um, and so this is significant because, you know, in Miami, you know, this is a city that's had a long history of, you know, very exclusionary uh, decision-making. Um, you know, since, you know, the 1950s, uh, you know, sort of governance has been very sort of technocratic. It's been technical experts who have been given basically the reins to determining how, um, you know, how uh, public services are going to be provided uh, to the citizenry in the region. Uh, but then at the same time, this is also overlaid on top of a region with a long history of segregation, a long history of racial violence that's led to a lot of uh, exclusion of racially marginalized as well as economically marginalized groups from having any kind of say or representation in local government decision making. And so, you know, sort of the simple fact that, you know, sort of community organizations that have long been pushing for social and environmental justice issues in the region are actually involved in resilience planning is significant. Now, you know, it's significant because, you know, precisely because you begin to open up the question of what does sort of a resilient Miami look like? What might a future Miami look like? And, you know, you begin to open up new kinds of problems when you bring in new voices into the conversation. You know, new kinds of issues come to light, um, you know, and you begin to think about resilience and climate change not as problems of, you know, simply like sea level rise that threatens, you know, sort of, you know, are you going to get, you know, 6% or 10% back on your real estate investment? Um, you know, no, it becomes much more about, you know, what are the livability and the habitability of the spaces that, you know, sort of everyone lives in? You know, are we building an inclusive uh, city that has, you know, sort of economic opportunities? opportunities for everyone, not just sort of tech bros, uh, you know, sort of hanging out in Brickell. And so, you know, this is a real opportunity um, to, uh, you know, sort of redefine what, you know, a response to climate change might entail. Um, and so, you know, it's an opportunity to bring in new kinds of issues, to uh, deliver new kinds of services to communities that, that have long been excluded. You know, sort of climate change is a kind of slow emergency that we're all starting to wake up to more and more. But it's for many people, you know, sort of across the South Florida region, they've been living with these kinds of insecurities uh, for years, if not decades. And so now we're beginning to see, you know, the chance for these people who have long been excluded to begin to have a say in, you know, sort of where you know, where the city should be going. But at the same time, you know, you're getting countervailing tendencies where, you know, sort of, you know, we continue to chase the next big thing in Miami, you know, what's the next big, you know, sort of, you know, sort of real estate boondog, you know, how are we going to continue to get people, you know, sort of flooding, uh, you know, sort of capital into the region to sustain the local real estate economy, you know, and so those oftentimes work at cross purposes. And we're seeing that unfold again, uh, playing out in social media nowadays. It's really interesting. I mean, we're we're talking not only about sort of what is to be done, but kind of who's going to do it, right? And uh, actually, maybe quickly, Simone. My my understanding is that uh, is that in the Amazon, and and I didn't see it overlaid on your maps, but that areas that indigenous people have been given control of have been uh, have been sort of much health. It's been much healthier for the forest. Um, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the importance of uh, you know empowerment in terms of in terms of actual results on the ground. Yeah, no, thanks for that question, Michael. So yes, uh, what we have in the Amazon, and it's not only in the Brazilian Amazon in general, we have seen in the past decades, uh, an empowerment of indigenous peoples and ind indigenous organizations taking control over their territories. Um, despite, uh, sometimes despite like the, the political climate uh, that, that many times, of course, is against uh, what, what their interests are, or you know, are in, uh, in clashing with, with those interests. Uh, and one thing I want to mention that I think is very important is their um, 
the system of governance, the indigenous governance of those territories. For example, in Brazil, which I'm much more familiar, uh, they have the territorial management plans. A publication just came out on, on the territorial government plans. Uh, and the territorial management plans they have, like um, they are implemented through their own ways of social organization or making decisions, but also in connection with the local governments, sometimes the municipalities, because you know, the municipality is like the smaller level, right, of governance where things get done. Uh, and as Kevin was saying, in, with the example of Miami, but in that aspect, it has, we have successful stories. We have a lot of problems as well, because not always the government, uh, local government want to work with indigenous peoples and want to uh, collaborate. But we have many stories in which the indigenous communities and organizations have, you know, collaborated or, or developed partnerships and even uh, some uh, um, joint funding for the implementation of these territorial management plans. And one aspect that some of these territorial management plans include is like um, the consultation protocols that has been developed by indigenous peoples in which any project or action or policy that will threaten you know, the integrity of their territories or their uh, cultural um, uh, habits or traditions uh, would have to go through this uh, consultation process, which is done according to their own uh, cultures, according to their own political organization. So I think that's, there are inspiring examples of that. And, and, you know, in Brazil, indigenous lands are, are protecting currently 21% of the Amazon, which it's, it's a significant portion. Uh, I mean, there, are, I mean, obviously, you know, it's going to be hard to sort of protect things, you know, if every government was like Miami, we'd have a real problem, right? I mean, uh, you know, that, that, that ain't going to get it done. Um, but clear, there's this sort of larger market forces at work. Um, Alex, uh, I mean, competition is a perfect example of sort of harnessing, you know, incentives to, to try to, you know, get people to do the right thing. Um, people talk about, you know, we're already starting to see some carbon pricing um, in parts of the United States and parts of the world. Um, Alex, can you talk a little bit about, you know, you're, we're also starting to see some of these larger financial institutions that are, you know, we're not going to invest in drilling in the Arctic or uh, we're going to be more sustainable, you know, we're going to look into sustainable investing. How do you see the private sector? You, you've worked in private and public public sectors. How do you see the private sector sort of being kind of a force for the solution, and and how can government help the private sector help us? Yeah, I, um, you know, I think uh, a number of different ways. I mean, one one is just recognizing that part of what what we need to do is not just give consumers a choice, but replace all the choices so that they're sustainable and don't have an impact on extinction or on climate change around what we're doing. Uh, the government can do that through regulations. The private sector can also do that. One of the things we're realizing is that 70% of stock prices in these large companies uh, and even in investment houses, there is, is based on the perception that people have of those companies. So increasingly for the companies to recruit the very best people, uh, in fact, to have a strategic advantage over, over their peers, to, to actually drive up things like their stock price, that sustainability is no longer sort of a side aspect. It, it increasingly is a line of business. And in fact, the disruptors that we see, as you know, in the food space, um, all, you know, whether plant-based foods or cellular agriculture, and the same thing applies for feed, uh, are ones um, that in, that are taking over market share because because they're creating competitive products that um, are are you know it's no longer plant based burgers taste like cardboard it is they taste as good uh, if, or not better than meat and then in fact the majority of the people who are now eating and buying these products are not people who are vegans or vegetarians which I think is a very powerful tool I think the other the other piece is actually having accountability and transparency in those supply chains, as well as accountability and transparency in things like our trade policy. If I can just show one picture, uh, if, if I don't know if I could be granted the screen sharing capabilities, I could, um, I don't know if you've got that capability or someone else. Otherwise, uh, on. you can help us. Yeah, great. Oh, uh, you can share. So. I, can you guys see this image? Uh, that is being shared right now? Yes. 
So this is a place called La Pampa. It's actually across the border from Brazil. Um, it, is, uh, it is a place where in three years, 30,000 miners cleared 15,000 hectares of forest. This is uh, Madre de Dios province in Peru. I was down there uh, in 2019. Uh, Conservation X Labs is working uh, on uh, this issue of artisanal mining. So this is illegal, unorganized uh, clearance of the force. It's done by individuals, not done by companies, not done by others. Um, and this is some of the most biodiverse territory per hectare on the planet, the most specious place on the planet. We're at the base, uh, we're, we're next to Manu National Park. We're on the base of where the Andes come down into the Amazon. It is um, unbelievable. I'm a tropical biologist. It is unbelievable. It is ground zero of, of biodiversity. And this was, you know, three, four years ago was 200 foot high trees. Right, filled with jaguars and toucans and everything else that you imagine um, from a forest. And it is now a landscape, one third of which is water that is contaminated with mercury. And that is all because of international demand for gold, which has risen because of the pandemic, right? And it, the same thing, there's 40 million to 70 million people in this sector. It is their pathway out of extreme poverty. So it's not as easy as just banning uh, the solution. Uh, and, and in fact, it is the major source of tantalum that's used in the capacitors in our cell phones and our computers. It is a major source of how we get cobalt um, around the world. Just to show another picture, it is global. It's in 80 different countries around the world. This is gold mining in Gabon. Uh, this was actually taken from something called a snot bot, which is a drone that samples, um, Michael probably knows about this, that samples the effluent coming out of uh, essentially blowholes of whales and they came across this. Uh, it is the number one source of gold mining, artisanal scale gold mining is the number one source of global pollution, uh, of mercury pollution, right? Which is bioaccumulating in our fish and in our ocean. So, you know, part of it is that we have amazing companies like, Am like, like um, Apple, that are really good, but still do not have the transparency in their supply chains to go back to the source. And the way that those individual miners are connecting back to the large companies, they're demanding these products. The cobalt used in electric cars, that is part of the solutions that we're looking for, is through criminal networks that are involved in trafficking in persons, weapons, drugs, and, and, and wildlife. Um, so it is fundamentally facilitated by environmental crime is our demand that is actually getting it. And until we actually address these issues, um, we're not, you know, just in Peru, we lost an area the size of Chicagoland. Uh, we're not gonna be able to solve them. Um, and, and part of it is gonna be the companies themselves being accountable, responsible. That's why the Amazon plan that Simone talked about actually really gets at that. And I think is a very powerful solution for what we need to do. But part of it is, is just getting companies to recognize that they can actually, they will be much more competitive by actually addressing these issues before they themselves are disrupted. That's great. Um, let's see, now I know we're uh, at some point I'm supposed to take questions from, uh, from the audience, but I'm not quite sure where I'm supposed to get those questions. Um, so uh, so let, me, let me throw now, out- Michael. All right. I think it's now. I mean, it's we are we have the last uh, fifteen. Oh, here minutes. It, oh, I see Q and A at the bottom. Okay, I got it. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait for another one. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask ask one more for you guys, um, which is and this is something that a couple of you mentioned. Uh, you know, we've talked about what government can do, uh, what finance can do, what. Um, indigenous people can do. What can like somebody listening to this do? I mean, there's been, there, this has become a really, a, a big fight where I've, I've noticed a lot of environmentalists, I mean, I've bang, banged my spoon in my high chair about this a little bit, but I think too many environmentalists have sort of said, oh, you know, it's all about policy. Um, don't listen to those people who are trying to guilt you to, uh, you know, don't use single use plastic or, you know, or to, uh, you know, to it's not, drive an electric car, put solar on your on your house. It's not up to you. It's up to the big guys, um, which I've been very skeptical of. I think it's sort of hard to expect people to, you know, if we're if if this is a real climate emergency, 
I think presumably then everybody's got to kind of do their part and we have to treat it like an emergency. What are maybe all of you in a little bit of a lightning round can say, what are, what are some things that people should be doing to, to try to make this disaster less disastrous? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. I mean, I think it, it is about all of the above. I mean, the individual actions matter, but you can't let that get in the way and say, okay, it's all on individuals to reduce their carbon footprint and let government off the hook. It's got to be all of the above. But at the same time, there's a lot we can do. Changing our light bulbs around the house, how we do transportation. There are ways to uh, make a difference and be in line with, uh, you know, Read your seafood guide. Are you eating sustainably sourced seafood? Um, you know, there are lots of tools out there for consumers to figure out if the, cho if the choices they are making um, are having a lower ecological footprint overall, not just carbon footprint. Because look, we got to decarbonize our emissions. There's no question. But, you know, I think as Alex and Simone and Kevin have all talked about, it's about the whole environmental system because that's what supports our economy. It's what supports our livelihood and we got to get it all put together. And I think we finally have um, the political willpower through most of the globe and, and in this country to start making that happen. And it does start at people's home. Kevin, I saw you nine. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I think, you know, especially thinking about what, uh, you know, sort of the way that Simone and uh, Alex sort of presented, um, you know, sort of different ways that, you know, sort of these environments are being destroyed, you know, sort of in Brazil and uh, sort of, you know, Western Africa in, uh, you know, uh, Peru, you know, it really points to the way that, you know, sort of there is an extractive economy, um, you know, that is driving a lot of this stuff. Um, and this is all organized around sort of the eradication of difference, the eradication of environmental difference, the eradication of social difference. And, you know, we're seeing this play out in political movements as well, too, you know, sort of with the transition from, uh, you know, sort of over the last four years of the far right from, you know, sort of a um, you know, sort of aspirationally fascist movement into a full on sort of fascist insurrection, you know, this is a manifestation of, you know, sort of this continued push to eradicate difference. And so I think, you know, one of the key things people can do in this light, you know, when we begin to think of the problem as, you know, not just about, you know, sort of what do we do with carbon molecules, but this is about the entire sort of way of life that we're all sort of enmeshed in. You know, one of the things we can do is to really amplify the voices and get involved with folks who have been, you know, sort of organizing around these issues, who have been involved in pressuring um, sort of local governments, national governments, um, who have been involved in, you know, these kinds of, you know, sort of social justice and environmental justice movements. Uh, you know, these are the folks who have, you know, there's already sort of groundwork set up, you know, there's networks that we can get involved in and support. You know, support can mean different things. You know, for some of us, we might be really good at sort of organizing and, you know, sort of marching and stuff like that. For others of us, you know, we might, you know, be better at, you know, sort of providing financial donations that can support the activities uh, that other folks are doing. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we can get involved, but I think the most important thing to do is to get organized because there are people who, you know, sort of have been involved for a long time in movements that are designed to protect, you know, sort of difference, whether it's environmental difference, social difference, cultural difference. And, you know, I think it's important if we're concerned about this to begin, you know, really supporting and getting involved with those, with those groups. Um, so I, I just one of the questions from the audience here that I'm going to uh, I'm going to use, but then use it as a sort of jumping off for you guys to take a large. So somebody, it's uh, Michelle Abrams, is asking um, about whether the Biden plan failure to mention green hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and uh, and generators, the role they can play whether that's a shortcoming in the administration's plans. Um, if anybody wants to jump in specifically on hydrogen, but also generally about uh, the Biden, about what we've seen so far from Biden, um, whether it makes you hopeful and uh, if there's anything in particular that you think is important that he's done or not done. Um, uh, wanted somebody uh, take this. Alex, go for it. Yeah. So. I think the hydrogen question um, is an important one. I don't have the answer to it, but I actually think it highlights something else that we need in our national security apparatus, which is we need scientists and technologists at the front line, uh, at the level, at senior levels in the Department of State, in the Department of Defense, at USAID, helping make these decisions. Because essentially, the foreign, you know, we just saw a week 
of foreign policy experts, right, that are trained in area studies and political science and, and economics, really valuable topics. But increasingly, it is pandemics, it is climate change, it is deforestation, it is understanding energy and, and these, it is understanding finance that we need actually scientists and, and engineers working alongside of us to be able to address these fundamental problems because none of our people None of the people dealing with non-proliferation, none of those entities that are making these decisions have the subset of knowledge to allow us to do it. And that means that schools like FIU, like the McCain Center uh, and other places uh, you know, that are training the next generation of diplomats need to, in even institutions like the Council on Foreign Relations and CSIS, need to fundamentally change the makeup of who's in the room to be able to answer these types of questions. I think it's a great question. I think it's a tough question to really get into the details of, of what is the best solution? What are the inadvertent effects of supporting that policy? And how do you test out those policies? The problem is we just don't inform policy and national security have the people who can help us do that <laughs> at the highest levels. And we've seen it, right? I mean, that's a we, we've seen, we're, we're getting sort of the uh, the climate equivalent of uh, you know injecting bleach or what is it, hydro hydro the, the the medicine that doesn't work. We've seen it dealing with the COVID crisis that if you're not listening to the experts, um, you know you're gonna you're gonna have some really bad solutions. Um, I guess you know and it's probably you're gonna get tons of corn ethanol, right, or whatever uh, you know whatever the most powerful po you know political interest wants. I, I, and just to follow up, academia needs to change too, right? Because the incentive structure in academia is not to put knowledge and service to society. I turned down uh, my pathway into academia after 9-11 because I, and, you know, got deployed to Iraq three months later because I was like, instead of actually teaching uh, at Yale, because I realized that there was an amazing, that, that we needed to actually put that knowledge and service to society. I think that we need to think about how academia allows scientists and engineers to be rewarded and and professors to be rewarded for applying that work at the highest levels of government in and and incentivized to do so not just in terms of publication and peer review and that means like having these people who serve in the translation of that knowledge to society to 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 others as well awesome point uh simone what uh what, what would you like to see what and what what do you like or not like of what you are seeing no, I couldn't agree more on these points that uh, Kevin and Alex shared on that. I think also that we, since we are in this like window of opportunity right now, I don't know how long, I mean, the window will last because uh, the COVID-19 is like this window of opportunity, but we're like, okay, we shouldn't wait, right? We need to do as we move, like Michael said as well. And one thing that I think is very important is kind of re-evaluate re our values. Uh, reevaluate um, what value we put. Of course, we want to have economic stability. We want to have economic security, economic, I wouldn't even say economic growth, but we have, we want to have, uh, we want to have economic viability, let's say, and we need to fight inequality and all the injustices and things like that while we do all that, right, in a democratic society. But, you know, just a reevaluation of our values in connection with nature in general. Um, I, I was doing a review, I'm doing a paper review for the Ibezon values, for the values assessment. And then the way, even the way we value nature is, is very economic, it's very one-sided, it's very monistic. Uh, you know, just looking at use value or economic value or something, when we look at nature, you just see like products or whatever, you know, money coming out of it. And I think we need to, to work with society and to work with our children, to work with education systems, to, to have a more plural understanding of the values of biodiversity, the value of nature and, and work with that because uh, it's, a, it's a crisis of values as well. It's not only a crisis of uh, you know, our use of nature, but how we relate to it and that we are losing knowledge about like eco literacy. It's like nobody knows anything about nature anymore because we're losing so many species and that knowledge of nature, that's not the knowledge only that is taught at universities, but the knowledge that, that you develop in that connection with nature is really being eroded. So that's, I'm very concerned about that. And, and I would say, like, if I have to leave a message, like, consume, buy, and live like your life and the life of your children would depend on it because it is an emergency. 
Oh, that's great. I love it. We're getting a little, a little philosophical here as we, <laughs> as we close up, which is, which is great. So that now let me, I'll, I'll go with the, to Kevin in this one, um, since to, to go back to values, right? Certainly Biden has, when he talks about climate change, I mean, we've all heard the line, right? I hear one word, jobs, right? And, uh, and we're certainly, you know, there's a very kind of, you know, climate's great. We're gonna, it's gonna, it's good for the economy. We're gonna create this new clean energy boom. Um, you know, and it's true, there are a lot more solar jobs than there are coal jobs. Um, this is all gonna be good. Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, impossible food, the, like the impossible burger is gonna be better than the, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna taste better. Tesla is gonna be a cooler car than those, you know, stinky old gas guzzlers that explode in front of you every, every three seconds. Um, Kevin, is, is this gonna work? Is that like, you know, can, can climate change be attacked by telling everybody like, there's not gonna be any sacrifice. It's all gonna be awesome. Um, you've sort of suggested some kind of deeper structural critiques of, of society and some of what you've said. I'd like to hear you take that on. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the idea that, you know, sort of we're not going to, that there's not going to be any kind of pain, that we can find a pain-free solution collectively, um, you know, sort of is another one of these sort of, um, you know, sort of dangerous myths that we have that sort of is, is there about, you know, sort of shaping the way that we um, sort of value and interact with nature, as Simone was saying. Um, you know, because, you know, I think what COVID has shown is that, you know, when we have these kinds of pandemics, you know, there's not going to be a return to normal. Like, you know, I can't envision, you know, sort of a, a going back to normal after something like COVID, you know, we're going to be inventing a new normal. But the process of getting to that new normal is going to involve, you know, sort of a collective, you know, it's going to involve a little bit of, you know, sort of instability, uh, sort of collectively. And if we want to put it in terms of, you know, sort of the systems thinking that Michael talked about earlier, um, you know, when we're thinking about this, you know, we're talking about what's at stake is really kind of like a metastable system. And, you know, do we want a metastable system or do we need to actually begin transitioning, uh, you know, to new kinds of um, just new ways of organizing, you know, sort of society and our economy. I think, you know, what COVID is showing is that if we don't respond in some way, then there's going to be major impacts that people are going to feel that are going to reverberate throughout all aspects of our daily lives, um, you know, just a complete, you know, sort of stoppage and a complete disruption of all the rhythms and timings and spacings and behavior patterns that we're used to. And, you know, that's going to come whether we, you know, sort of whether we bury our heads in the sand and say that oil and and gas and all that and coal are you know the way of the future or not um, but then the question is if we can prepare for these kinds of disruptions you know we can begin to at least um, you know sort of be prepared with you know sort of the financial resources and the knowledge resources to recognize and sort of respond in a way that makes sure you know that you know we are being you know sort of equitable in the way that uh, you know sort of we design responses michael do you you were nodding your head did you want to uh, did you want to jump in yeah well i mean i think just to kind of pull maybe a few of these things together. I mean, I think you mentioned the, the coal miners, there's more jobs in, in solar, but is that job gonna to go to that coal miner? Think about the, the miners in the Amazon that it is making no money and doesn't have an opportunity. And then all the people out there that are buying these products that would wanna protect the environment, but don't even know. And so we have to really think about that human element a lot more. I mean, our work on sharks, you know, yes, People might want to go dive with sharks and spend more money than that than somebody fishing a shark. But is the dive operator the same, the fisherman you're telling not to catch the shark? So we have to build those systems or else we're going to be in this political metronome and people are going to be left behind and then they're going to respond because they're in a bad spot and we're going to go backwards. So, you know, I think we really have to think when we're talking about those jobs, who is getting them and how are we um, helping the people that are most affected so we are not putting the burdens entirely on certain sections. But I think that there is this piece on us as educators and as scientists. I was just talking to a bunch of uh, biology faculty and grad students today, and the, the passion for starting to share what's going on is there. But we need to make sure it doesn't matter what field you're in, whether you're it's through high school, secondary, you're in college, you're in law school. We have to change the way we talk to people because I think a lot of people just don't understand the connections and, and how it makes sense to them. So I, I think even more than values, um, we need to empower people to make the right decisions because they just don't know and, and uh, accidents and, or unintentional uh, consequences could be damaging. So I, I'm very hopeful with the direction we're going, um, but, but we can't take our eye off the ball just because we have someone in the White House um, who's moving uh, fairly rapidly in the right direction. Alex. And, and Alex's point, it's get everybody on deck beyond the ivory towers and out there doing good things. 
Alice, I think you wanted to jump in on sort of what uh, what people could do also, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think that there, you know, there's the very simple things of eat less meat, drive electric cars, um, wh you know, don't partake in fast fashion every every week uh, in terms of changing your clothes uh, and and where you even get your clothes are great new sites like ThreadUp where people can do it. But I think fundamentally it is thinking about these opportunities as innovators and entrepreneurs. And I think, you know, we, our, our environmental schools, our schools of, um, you know, shouldn't be just sort of staffing middle management at the large international NGOs, but should be really generating this next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs. And then on the investment side, we need to think about, you know, the challenge of impact investment is it's frequently neither impactful nor is it investment. And I know we were talking just about a fund right when we started the conversation, but we need the equivalent of sort of impact venture, which is high risk, high reward, high impact brought together. Um, that's what we are seeing. And in, in the ocean space, we supported a company called New Wave Foods, which makes shrimp out of red algae, doesn't have 15 to 20 pounds of bycatch for every pound of shrimp you get, doesn't have the slavery, doesn't have the mangrove deforestation. Um, it is, these are sorts, it tastes like shrimp, cooks like shrimp. It's now vegan and kosher, not being shellfish. These are the types of solutions that we should encourage and schools should be training people to actually get, get into, into place. And by the way, I totally agree with Michael behavior change. Like we've pretended in conservation and climate change that humans are, are not in the mix. Right. And in fact, they are very essential and understanding behavioral science uh, has, and marketing and, and psychology has to be key uh, to the approaches we take. Guys, I think we're gonna, we're just about out of time. Um, with all due respect to what Kevin said about how we're, uh, we're, you know, it's not gonna be normal anymore. I really look forward to when it is normal and we can start to do things like this in, in person. Um, but this has, been a, this has been a really, really great panel. I wanna thank you, thank you all for, for not coming, but clicking. Thank you. Mike, thanks so much. Uh, terrific job moderating. And to Simone and Kevin, Michael and Alex, that was a fantastic panel. Um, very practical too. Really appreciate the, the suggestions and recommendations on what people can do. So I, I think a great way to wrap us up uh, here uh, for this first week. We have 10 more weeks of this conference to go. No, I'm joking. Um, but uh, this, this has been a, a, a very, very uh, uh, fulfilling week, I hope, for everyone who's watched and uh, want to thank everybody. I'm not going to, I'm going to let uh, Dean John Stack uh, mention people by name. I, I do want to single out in particular, though, um, the outstanding work of Rigo and Andre, who made this happen from a technological uh, a vantage point. Without them, none of us would be on this screen right now. So just a, a real shout out to you guys and to a tremendous team that I've worked with here in preparing for this during this whole week. Um, so it would not be possible without an amazing team. And that team is led by John Stack, the founding dean of the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. And he is going to close us out. Over to you, Dean Stack. Thank you, David. <clears throat> uh, it's, a, it's been a great week. Uh, so we come to the end of the line for our fourth annual State of the World Conference and what a week we've had. I'm so grateful to you, David, uh, for what you've done. You pulled together this amazing week with our friends and colleagues at the McCain Institute, Mark Green and Paul Fagan, Thank you for your extraordinary work conceptualizing what it turned out to be a first rate virtual conference. As they say, it takes a village. So I do want to uh, thank the FIU team that worked tirelessly behind the scenes with David Kramer to bring you the best of FIU. From the Green School, Pedro D. Boda, Amy Ellis, Dana Fernandez, Jeanette Garcia Montes, Daniel Lederman uh, from the Graham Center. As David noted, Andre Rodriguez and Rigo, you were fantastic. From the Division of External Relations, Sandy Gonzalez Levy, Dania Pearson Adams, Eddie Merrill, Jenny Rivera, 
Nicole Del Valle, Diane Fernandez, and Eileen Sola Troutman, and from our Office of Governmental Relations, the irrepressible Carlos, Carlos Becerra. And finally, a very sp special thank you to Andrew Duncan and Charles Davidson for their uh, very, very generous support of the conference. FIU President Mark Rosenberg opened this week's conference with his belief that universities are communities of memory and hope. At the Green School, we take that mandate very seriously. Our commitment to bringing both practice and theory into the classroom is manifest in the courses that we teach uh, uh, on the basis of a wonderful faculty. Our annual State of the World Conference is made possible by the transformative gifts of our donor, donors. Ambassador Stephen J. Green, his wife Dorothea Green, and daughter Kimberly Green. The Green family recognized the critical importance of weaving together theory and practice as a way of understanding many of the fundamental issues defining our world while underscoring the need to offer life-changing opportunities to a diverse, determined, and inclusive community of students. This past week, we covered the world and explored some of the most formidable challenge facing us as a human community. We heard from more than 100 panelists with diverse personal and professional backgrounds hailing from the US, Russia, the Republic of Georgia, Germany, the UK, Zimbabwe, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Ukraine, Australia, Lithuania, Chile, Estonia, and the Netherlands. Thank you for your voices, for your stories, for your wisdom, and for your hope for change. We learn much from you. We witness civil discourse and debate grounded in critical thinking and observable facts. I believe there is a hunger out there for such thoughtful conversations that provoke people to think, reflect, and inspire them to work together to overcome differences and help create a better world. We do this, of course, for our students. They are the reason we are all here they will be the leaders and change makers of tomorrow. And to them, to our students, we believe you can build a more just, peaceful and prosperous world. I am so proud of them. Thank you all for joining us. This has been a fantastic time and uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs>